All right, thank you everybody who showed up today. Um, we are going to be going over PID control and uh, and towards the end, I'll talk a little bit how we can integrate that into our robot software. And basically PID control is more or less the de facto method to um, control like subsystems. For example, if you're either using an elevator or an arm or nowadays we're seeing it more and more often even controlling a drivetrain using PID control. Um, uh, this is like the number one way to do it. And not only do motors already offer, like if you pay for the motor expensive motors, they already give you like libraries and whatnot to use the pit controller. The pit controllers are built into the motors themselves, or you can use software to also do pit control, which is very useful if you decide to use PID that is not in the motor or something like that. There's a lot of ways and uh, we'll go over that in this slide. But first of all, yeah, they are built into the motor controllers. Um, but Let's go ahead and talk about what in the world PID is, okay? Because they're seen everywhere. They're pretty unanimous, okay? And so PID is an acronym that stands for Proportional Integral Derivative. And each one of that proportional integral and derivative stands for a specific constant that you modify within the PID controller. And like I said, it's the most common way to control motors accurately and precisely in FRC. And uh, this is a fun little fact. I talked about PID in the in the case of motors, but it, they're used in a lot of other places too. For example, if you own a 3D printer, the bed temperature and the hot end temperature is actually controlled by a PID controller. So that's pretty fun. So it's easier to explain PID with an example rather than uh, trying to um, rather than trying to directly go into what PID does. So let's go in and talk about a real world example here. So let's say you're at a red light. So your car is stopped at the red light, right? And you're carrying a few people, you have several passengers. So obviously you don't wanna drive like crazy. You want to drive smoothly because as you know, if you like brake super hard or accelerate super hard, your body is gonna experience a lot of G-forces and like jerk everybody around, right? So if you're at the red light and the light suddenly turns green, you wanna speed up to a speed of 35 miles an hour, which is a very common speed limit for most roads. And I have two options here. Do you mash the accelerator to the bottom and try to take off as fast as you can? Or do you slowly push on the accelerator and gradually increase? Uh, you guys can say A or B in the chat. Right, okay. So uh, I have one person that said B, which is right. You wanna slowly push on the accelerator and gradually increase the amount of gas you give the car because that way you accelerate nice and smooth. So, okay, great. You've ex accelerated slowly by gradually adding more to the gas pedal, right? But now you're driving 30 miles an hour and you have to slow down, right? Because if you, if you keep on adding gas into the pedal, you're eventually going to keep on accelerating, accelerating. You're going to add even more gas and you're eventually going to fly past 35 miles an hour. And so if, if you've never driven before, also suddenly releasing the pedal will also cause a jerk to the passengers, okay? So oh, what do you wow. do? Yeah, well... Because 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 the, the 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 car will suddenly slow down. No, I'm in my, maybe, okay. Maybe not in your car, crazy. But that's <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what do you do? Do you fully release the pedals all of a sudden once you like get close to thirty five miles an hour, or do you slowly release the pedals? Right. That's right. It's not really, It's also B. I think I made all the correct answers B. Anyways, but I think you guys can understand what I'm saying here, right? Like you want to slowly get off the pedal so that you gradually get up to thirty five in a smooth fashion. But now, oh no, you release the pedal too much, perhaps by accident, right? And now you're going 32 miles an hour instead of 35 miles an hour. So what do you do? Oh shoot, oh, oh no, okay. So if, if, you're, if you're slightly under 35 miles an hour, what do you do to the gas pedal? Do you like add more, do you reduce? Yeah, you slowly push on the gas, right? So, th so that's what you do. You slowly push on the gas to try to get up to 35 miles an hour. And ah, you've gone and done it again. Now you're going too fast. Instead of 35 miles an hour, you're going at 37 miles an hour. So what do you do now? That's right, you slowly release the pedal. And so let's talk about what happened here. So our target was 35, 35 miles an hour and we wanted to get up to speed from zero miles an hour. So we're not moving and hold our speed at 35 miles an hour. And so what we say is that there, this is a very simple, I don't know what I wrote here. Uh, this was a very simple example of the proportional part of PID, okay? So if you think about it, the farther, we are, the farther away we are from our target, the greater the error, 
error meaning how far away are we from the target? So sample, the error can be described as a difference between our current state, based on, so in this example, the speed that we're currently going and our target. And in this case, our target is the speed limit, 35 miles an hour. So if our target is 35 miles an hour, what is the error? So what do you guys think is the error for A? Okay, some resolved it already. That's right. So the error for A is 23, right? And that can be simply solved by saying um, 35 minus 23, okay? Or sorry, 35 minus 12, okay? Um, but something to keep in mind is we should also consider the fact that it's possible for error to be negative as well. If we're over it, then our error should also be negative. So instead of, sorry, you're right about seven for B, but we, it would be a little bit more accurate to say negative seven because we are seven over the target, which means we want to decrease our speed by negative seven. So do you see uh, what I'm talking about here? So the error changes depending on our current speed. And based on how big that error is, we'll change the speed that we're going at, okay? So let's, let's look at how proportional works, all right? So the way that proportional works is that it adds or decrease input proportional to the error. And um, Wendy, I know you just joined. Uh, we're, we're talking about PID controllers and how they can control motors and whatnot. Um, if you wanted to hear about what I said earlier, you can go check out the video recording later. Anyways, the way proportional works is it adds or decrease input proportional to the error. Okay, so let's assume that our gas pedal in our in our theoretical car can go from zero to one hundred percent. Okay, so zero is fully released and one hundred percent is fully pushed down. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and ditch the example that we said earlier, how I said we want to accelerate slowly. Um, let's just say that we want to get to thirty five as quick as possible, but we also don't want to still make it like sort of smooth, okay? So there's an inherent acceleration to accelerating. We can slow down faster than we accelerate. If our error is 35 miles an hour, so super big, right? Because we're right now, we're not moving. Uh, let's put our gas pedal to 100% so it can quickly uh, speed up, okay? So because the error is really big right now, we're gonna try to go as fast as we can, okay? And if our error is zero miles an hour, meaning we are zero miles an hour away from our target, we're already going at 35 miles an hour. We don't need to increase or decrease our speed. So we just give the gas pedal 0%, right? We don't need to, we don't need to accelerate. So uh, let's just let go of the gas pedal. There's no reason to. And if our error is five miles an hour, we only need to increase our speed a little. So maybe we give the gas pedal only about 10%, right? And then, uh, so that way we can speed up a little bit. So you can see the greater the air, uh, we change how much power we give to the gas pedal, uh, how much we push down the gas pedal, right? So does the, does the sort of just a proportional make sense? Wait, if the air is negative, it's the same except we slow down, right? So um, let's go ahead and, and it's not totally accurate to think about it this way, but let's just say if the air is negative, we just slowly push on the brake a little bit, right? I hope that can sort of make sense. So that will slow the car down. Or Except technically, that robots don't have brakes. Yeah, so um, uh, that's why the, the car example isn't perfect, just because of the way the system works. But it's a good generalization. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna go ahead and leave the the car analogy a little bit, and we're gonna go ahead and dig into what PID is. Okay, so I made a little simple graph here. Oh, I hope it's simple, and uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and slowly break down uh, this graph, okay? So can I get the pointer? Yeah, there you go. So you see the pointer here, okay? So this green line is gonna be our target. So this is the speed that we wanna go up to. So on the left side, uh, obviously this is gonna be 35 miles an hour and zero. And this is our gas pedal, zero to one, right? This is, our, uh, this is how much input we can give to the gas pedal, okay? So in a good hypothetical scenario, this is what we want, okay? So, Obviously at rest, everything's gonna be zero. Our target is zero, so our error is zero because we're currently going zero miles an hour. And so we're gonna give the input zero. And now all of a sudden, we're gonna go ahead and set our target to 35 miles an hour, right? So all of a sudden our error shoots up to 35 miles an hour as well. And as a result, because our error is so large, our input is gonna shoot up to one. Now, obviously because of one, the car is gonna start moving forward. So let's say at this point here, at this point here, we're already going at about 10 miles an hour. So our error is gonna decrease a little bit 
and our input is also going to start dropping off a little bit as well. Maybe here we're already at uh, probably around like 20 miles an hour or so. Obviously, our input, our error has decreased even more, and the input also decreases with it. And then eventually, um, when the error becomes zero, aka we are currently moving at 35 miles an hour, we're at our desired speed, we're not going to be providing any input to the gas pedal. So this is why it's called proportional. The input that we give is directly proportional to the error that exists. Okay, you can see how the the input uh, the input very closely mirrors the shape of the of the error over time. Okay. So does does proportional sort of make sense to you guys right now? Can you guys give me a yes or no in the reactions? All right, let's go ahead and move on. And so as you can see, proportional increases decreases the input based on how large the error is, right? Now let's talk about derivative. So this is the D part of PID. And so um, refer to back to the other example where it, like, uh, where is it? Ah, this part, like you release the pedal too much. So you actually slow down too much. So you add a little bit more gas and then you went too far again. So you let off the gas again. And this kind of cycle repeats over and over again. We call this an oscillation, right? And you can see here, um, uh, you can see here that the, the purple line, which is our, uh, our speed and the green line is our target. So purple line is our current speed. You can see we accelerate quickly at first, right? But then we overshoot. So we let go and then we undershoot, overshoot, undershoot, overshoot. So if you push on the pedal too aggressively and speed up quickly, there's a high chance you'll accelerate, accelerate too quickly and go over the target speed. And that's what derivative is for. Because if the proportional is too aggressive, it will oscillate. If the P, if, if, if yeah, basically if you give it too much power, you're gonna, you're gonna over accelerate. And then when you over accelerate too much, it's gonna de-accelerate too much, et cetera, et cetera, right? So yeah, it'll look a bit like a sine wave. And uh, yes, an, an oscillation, you can say an oscillation is one cycle, but it'll oscillate. Yeah, an oscillation is like a sine wave. So if you were to graph it in like, because we have a lot of tools in WPI level and not, if you graph the speed and your PID is tuned to be too aggressive, you will see like a sine wave like shape, okay? And so the solution to that is if we're approaching the target rapidly and the error is starting to get low, right? So your, your, your error is like only five or 10 miles an hour, but, we're, but the speed in which the error is decreasing is like really quick. We obviously want to reduce the input. We want to de-accelerate early, right? So hence the name derivative. And if you've taken calculus before, derivative in calculus is just how quickly a value is changing. Are we, for example, are we accelerating 10 miles an hour? Are we de-accelerating 10 miles an hour compared to 30 miles an hour? Or sorry, sorry, 30 miles an hour per second or 50 miles an hour per second. Basically how quickly that value is changing, right? And so if we're approaching our target of 35 miles an hour quickly, um, we should release the pedal early so we don't overshoot our target, right? So it's kind of like you're anticipating it. You know that you're accelerating really quickly and you know that you're approaching 35. So let's go and let off the pedal because, we, because we're approaching 35 so quickly. Right, So derivative changes the input based on how quickly the error is changing and reduces input. And because of that, it's also been called the damping constant because it sort of dampens the response from the proportional, right? Because uh, dampening meaning it kind of like suppresses and makes sure that uh, it's not able to push it too far, right? And that's really great because not only does it make the motion more accurate the first time, it can also reduce oscillations, which can not only make the motion more stable around its target, it can also let it arrive to the target faster because it doesn't have to oscillate and then find its stable point, okay? So you can see here, uh, you can see here in this example, you see how very quickly overshoots and then it oscillates a little bit, right? Here, uh, it's gonna, speed's gonna ramp up, ramp up, and then you, you can see here that our speed is climbing very fast, but then we really quickly slow down early so that we don't overshoot it. And what's going on here technically is that this red line indicates the error. You can see here, as we approach here, this bottom part, you see the error, the slope of the line. If we were, were to take this section and we just draw a tangent line, AKA just have a line that barely touches that curve, you can see the slope is very negative, right? It's pointing downwards a lot. And that's indicative to the PID controller that Oh no, we're approaching it too quickly. Quick, let's slow down early, right? And you can see here, if I were to draw another line here, uh, I'm not sure if you can follow where my pointer is going, you can see the slope is less and then even less. So the, the D term will see that we're approaching our target quickly and it will lessen our input, all right? Does this sort of make sense to everybody? 
All right, so that's the derivative term. All right, and finally, let's go ahead and talk about integral. Okay. So this is the final term that we usually encounter in PID. Now I know that I comes before D, but I'll get into, get into that soon. So let's go ahead and imagine an elevator, an elevator in FRC. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess it can apply to a real world elevator. But anyways, an elevator in FRC. Obviously an elevator in FRC, we're gonna have to carry some sort of weight up and down, whether it is the weight of a gain piece or literally the weight of the mechanism itself that goes up and down, right? If we imagine an elevator, in order for a motor to keep the elevator held at a certain position, it also has to fight gravity, right? Because gravity wants to pull the whole thing downwards. And so the motor will, if we want to hold a position, the gravity has to fight gravity, or sorry, the motor has to fight gravity with a little bit of power. So if we just have P or D, the motor will push against the gravity until it stalls out, meaning the motor is applying a constant torque, but it's not spinning. And that's the problem is that the, the motor will always be slightly off from the target and it will actually hold the position slightly below. And that's just the nature of it having to fight another force, in this case, gravity, right? So how do we solve that? We use an integral part of PID. The integral part of PID is based on the integral of the error as a function of time. And this is a little bit, um, this is like very calculus speak here, but in basic terms, or layman's terms, basically the longer the error is not zero, the more the integral is going to grow. And because the integral becomes larger, it's going to add an input to nudge the error towards zero. Well, I mean, it, it, I'm saying add input here, but again, also decrease input, right? So the longer time we spend far away, or not far away, close, but not really to the target, the more we're gonna slowly add a little bit, okay? And so I drew a little bit of a graph here, and this is an example. You can see this uh, slight pink part that I uh, highlighted underneath the error. If you were to graph error, you can imagine the integral as being the area underneath the curve to the x-axis, okay? And basically, uh, the greater this area, the more the integral is going to react to it. So if we're constantly if we're constantly just flatlining out here, obviously the area is gonna keep growing and growing. There's no end to it as time goes on. But because of the integral term, it sees that the area keeps increasing over time. So it's gonna just start nudging a little bit towards until the error is zero. If the error is zero, there's no area underneath the error curve, right? So the integral is gonna do nothing about it. The integral has done its job. It's nudged our current position towards the target, right? And so it compensates for a little bit of inaccuracies that you can see in P and D, especially when you're fighting against other forces, okay? So does the concept of I make sense to everybody, okay? So the integral decreases error. Yeah, basically the integral decreases error so that we're incredibly precise, okay? It's, th it's the la that last little nudge. Like for example, you know, if like, when you're doing something exact, let's say you have to put a block in an exact position on the table, you would obviously use a whole entire arm to pick up the block and put it there about right. And you would use your fingers and like poke at it a little bit until it's just in the right place. That small little poking part to make very small adjustments, it's just like the role of integral, okay? So in summary, P is the major reactionary part of the PID. If, is it an asymptote at the top? In general, yes. Uh, if you tune the PID carefully, you might see an asymptote. Actually, <clears throat> in general, actually, if you don't have the I term, it's definitely going to look like an asymptote if you have P and D tuned correctly, because it's never going to, it's never going to reach that green target because of other forces. In this case, gravity. If you do it at an integral, eventually it'll reach zero. And it, in, in fact, if you increase the I too much, if you make the I too aggressive, you'll cause oscillations. Okay, but yes, Vinny, um, it will look a lot like an asymptote. That's a good way. That's a good way to put it. So P is the reactionary part of PID. D is the part that kind of says, "Hey, hey, slow down. We're going too fast. We gotta, uh, we gotta react. We gotta dampen it." And then I is the last nudging part to try to get it into the correct position. So does this make sense? All right. So. What's all this talk about constants, all right? So a PID controller requires the use of a P, an I, and a D constant. And these constants are just how sensitive the PID controller is to the proportional integral and derivative parts of the PID controller. And like I said before, if you increase P, 
Oh, and I forgot to mention PID, the constants, they're numbers, they're doubles. Okay, so from zero to one or zero to 10, it actually can be theoretically any number as long as it's positive. So the greater the P, it'll react very quickly to a large error and the lower the P, the less reactive. Okay, and the greater the I, the more proactively it will try to nudge onto the target. And then the higher the D, the more dampening, the more it will try to slow down more aggressively. Now, a good note here is that if you increase any of these too high, you're going to cause oscillations or it just won't even work. You're going to cause it to act randomly. Okay. So there's very careful tuning involved with PID. And I'm going to tell it later. So there are a few types of PID loops that we often see in FRC. Okay. And the reason we call them PID loops is because in FRC, we use a lot of loops, right? You execute the same thing over and over again rapidly. And in fact, this is the way a lot of the industry does it as well. And as such, our PR and as such, there's a bunch of different kinds of loops you can use with pit controllers, right? So the first one is listed here. It's just a simple P loop. It's just PID, but with only the P. And in fact, in our own robot, we use this for vision because with vision, we don't necessarily need to dampen the response. Um, we can just make the P not as aggressive. And uh, especially for autonomous, where we have a specific thing where it can rotate to a specific heading. Because the RAM Z controller kind of helps correct for angle deviations, I literally just set the P loop to be quite aggressive. Even if it overshoots a little bit, the, the RAM Z controller can correct it. Okay, but that's the simplest part, the P loop. In fact, the P loop is almost so simple to a sense that you don't even need to use a library to use a P loop. But I'll carry on. The PD loop is probably the most common in uh, robotics. You use it if you have to, like, for example, move a, um, uh, what should we call it? So you have to move like a, oh, what's that mechanism? Like a, like a belt or something, like something that moves a bunch of balls in like a cartridge. Uh, it, okay, in a Doom Turtle, we call it the magazine, okay? For example, if you want to move the magazine to a certain position, you can use a PD loop. Um, in the case, you don't need an elevator to be super, super accurate. You can use a PD loop as well. Um, but in, for Doom Turtle, the place where we see the PD loop and the most common is for our velocity drivetrain, for controlling the velocity of our, our wheels. That, in that case, a PD loop is just enough, right? Because uh, we're only really finding friction and a PD loop is more than enough to compensate for that. And introducing the eye could actually, uh, could actually introduce some more instability. And then the third one is PI loop, which is sort of rare, but it's sometimes used for arms or elevators where you likely have to fight against another force. But again, without the D, it's very possible to cause oscillations and whatnot. So a PI loop is a very rare uh, <laughs> sort of loop. And then the most full featured one is obviously PID with all three of them. And this is really good for elevators that have to be quick and accurate, right? And uh, for example, this, uh, we use PID loop because we had time to tune the elevator properly for Doom Turtle. The elevator is the one that grabs the climber. And the PID loop just makes it so um, it goes where you want it to, right? And, but sometimes there are some mechanisms where using a full PID loop can be really challenging because it's hard to dial in the numbers correctly. And in doing so, you might just be throwing yourself in a circle, constantly finding the wrong numbers and then it becomes a mess. So there's a little bit of human error involved when it comes to tuning a PID loop. And again, I will get to tuning later. <laughs> so I'm gonna quickly step into code a little bit. I'm gonna talk about how you even use a PID controller. And like I said earlier in the very beginning, most advanced CAN motors already have a built-in PID controller that can often actually react faster and more accurate than running the PID controller in a Roborio. But WPI Lib offers a PID controller for in software if you want. And in general, they work basically the same as CAN PID controllers as well. So let's go and take a look at this guy. So the WPI lib library gives you a class called PID controller. You can see it in this section here. And obviously you assign it to a variable, right? Because you want to use the object again. And all you have to do is you have to make a new instance of the of a PID controller. So new PID controller, and you pass in the first one is P, second one is I, and the third one is D. I just threw in some random numbers in here. They're not indicative of how you set the values for a PID controller, but I hope this gets the gist, right? So you know in our subsystem code when we initialize the motor uh, as a member variable, right? You can also instantiate the PID controller here with your PID values, okay? And in order to calculate the error and give out an output, you of course have to feed it values so it can calculate error. And I mean, feeding the PID controller. And we do that by using encoder. 
Uh, we, I haven't taught how to link up an encoder in a software yet, so I'm not going to go into too descriptively. But basically, for example, an encoder can tell you how fast our drivetrain is going or what position we are on the elevator. Okay. And so all you have to do is run this piece of code, you pass in the encoder position where we are right now, and your desired set point where we eventually want to go, and it gives you your output into the motor. So say right now our encoder tells us we're one feet above the ground, but we want to go to three feet above the ground on an elevator. So then we set our set point to three feet, and then the, uh, the controller will give us our output to the motor. Okay. And then uh, one more thing is we probably want to do is the, we want to make sure that the integral isn't going to add or subtract too much from the input. Basically, if we're not even close, we don't want the integ integral to react like crazy. We only really want the integral to, to do the nudging job. So we'll say that the integral can only, can only nudge a little bit. Okay, so we basically say, okay, the integral term can only add negative 0 0.5 or 0 0.5, okay, to the output. And to make sure that the PID controller gives us negative one to one, which apparently wasn't available Oh, which apparently was available in the old version of PID control that WPI lib gives, but not anymore. Um, we have to use another method that WPI lib gives us called mathutil.clamp, which clamps the output. So in this case, in this piece of code, it will only give us negative 0.5 to 0.5. And Sanvri, uh, yeah, you would, okay. I think you would read the encoder in read periodic inputs and then you would, Oh, actually, no, 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 you're right. Yeah, we would do it in re-periodic inputs. All right, thank you, Grady. But yeah, basically, this is how you use the PID controller. Next class, I'll try to get us some uh, first-hand experience in trying to code a PID controller with the simulator, but I'll have to see if the simulator is even capable of that. All right, and this is my last slide for today. And this is the process of tuning PID loops, which is one of the more or less most exhausting parts about robotics. And the process of tuning PID loops for almost everything is about the same. And you want to tune in this order, P to D to I. So you want to tune P first to D and then to I. And that's simply because P loops are great if you want a really quick and simple solution. PD is great for almost literally every mechanism you'll find in robotics. And then the I will just help you add a little bit uh, extra level of precision, okay? And so you want to start everything from zero. P is zero, D is zero, I is zero and you slowly increase P by small increments and you test the response, okay? Eventually you get your P so that it's smooth, AKA it'll ramp up speed and it'll try to slow down. And if it oscillates just a little bit, if it overshoots a little bit, that's okay, all right? Because the next step is the D term. You increase D slowly until the oscillations go away, okay? And then finally, you increase I until it is able to home into the desired target position. Now, for a lot of things, Eventually, when you get when you finish tuning D, you don't really have to touch it anymore. But for an elevator, it'd be nice to do I. And you can, like, for example, the um, the hood on Doom Turtle. When I started tuning the I, I can see that the P and D do most of the work. It gets it there really quick, and I can just see the I go. Do, 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 do. I can see the hood just moving by small little increments because of the integral term. Okay, and it just gets it incredibly accurate to where I want it to go. All right, well, obviously, until the, the mecha physical mechanism itself has too much play, but I think you get my point. But basically, that's tuning PID loops, all right?